Well, I think we have everyone here and I'm just gonna start things off with some introductions while we wait for all the audience members to come along. So first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us. Today, we are going to have a lovely fireside chat between the authors of the recently released The Value Fly Will Effect book and the amazing Adrian Cockcraft. Uh, this fireside chat is being brought to you by IT Revolution. Um, we hope that you enjoy it. So I'm going to get started just a little bit by introducing our host, Adrian. Um, in case you didn't know who he is, he has had a very long career on the leading edge of technology. He's recently retired, but his uh, career uh, goes back to working at Amazon and AWS, as well as well, too many probably to mention. Um, we are very honored that he also wrote one of the forewords for the value flywheel effect um, after meeting these wonderful authors, I believe. So he is going to be chatting uh, today with everyone. I will be in the background to answer any problems that any of our audience members are having. And at the end, if we have some time, we'll open it up to Q&A. Please feel free to put any questions you might have over in the comments and we'll do our best to address them. But Adrian, over to you. Okay, well, thank you. And it's uh, thank you for putting all this together and getting us together again. Um, I think I'll just start by getting like, how did we, how did we end up here? Um, and sort of initially, you know, I came from Basically, after sort of figuring out all of these new ideas at Netflix, it became my job to explain that to people. And then when I was at Amazon, I was you know, talking to customers and saying, well, you know, this is what we did, and this is how to go to cloud, and this is how to speed everything up. And one of the customers I spoke to several times was Liberty Mutual, and I was usually surprised how, how forward thinking they were and how fast they were going for a relatively old company um in in insurance and eventually i met uh david somehow i forget exactly how we got this set up but, but we started having a regular call where we just get on get on a video call and we kept that going every month or so for um years i think it was but anyway and the ideas were developing and i was just saying and i would go to other people and say well you know if Liberty Mutual can do it, why can't you do it? And they go, well, what have they done, right? And at some point, Dave said, well, um, I'm thinking of writing a book. And he said, yeah, that's a good idea. You should write this stuff down. And, um, and with, uh, with Mark and Mike, they were kind of building all these things um, together. So get a bit further in, um, I knew the people at IT Revolution sort of introduced Dave to, to them and you know, persuaded you know, Gene Kim eventually, or Dave persuaded Gene Kim to um, do the book. And you should probably tell that story of, of how that meeting went. That's an interesting one. Um, and, and the other thing along the way was um, Simon Wardley, who wrote the second forward for the book and Wardley mapping, which was something that I thought was really interesting, David picked up on and is also fundamental to this story. So that, that sort of continued, we've all sort of moved on from the companies we were at now, but um, all this has been distilled in, into this really interesting book, which uh, I've been recommending to everybody as obviously writing the forward for it is a pretty good recommendation, but I've also been sort of keep telling people that you should need to go look at this, there's new ideas in here. And the fundamental thing that I think people don't really get is that it isn't just a little bit faster to, to work this way. It's sort of an order of magnitude faster. And it's so much faster, you can't actually conceive that, it, that things could get done that quickly until you've worked in an environment where all of the friction is out, taken out of the way and things just happen. And that was something that we sort of distilled something like that at Netflix. We got ridiculous amounts of stuff done very quickly with really a very small team. And that's kind of what I saw in, in this team. So I think I'll sort of hand over to maybe um, Dave next to sort of talk about, so how did you end up in this position and, and bring in the um, Mark and Mike as, as, as the story unfolds? Yeah, absolutely. thank you, Eugene. Very kind, too kind as always. 
Um, so I, I've been a software engineer forever, and I spent my 10 years working on telecoms. I joined Liberty around um, 2007, and uh, that's where I met Mark and Michael. And we were we can talk about what we were doing Liberty in a while, we can come back to that, but we, I found myself in a position that as Liberty Mutual were moving to the cloud in around 2013, I was in a position where we could maybe think, how can we do something different? And we started thinking, well, how do we build software differently? So we spent a few years experimenting and trying different things. And by our own, I think it was 2019, 2020, we kind of had this serverless first idea. And and, and you're right, Simon, Wardley was a massive kind of influence because um, uh, Mark and I had stumbled across his talks back in around probably 2013 or so. And we, we just loved the way he talked about the evolution of, of, tech, of, of, of technology. And that kind of customer value chain. Plus yourself, as you know, I, I always loved your line about um, Netflix, about how we got all the people and all that that thinking. So we were just kind of like sponges soaking up all the all the different kind of conference talks. So we started to formulate this this idea of how we could write software differently, and that was our kind of serverless first approach. Um, and then as we started to try out these um, different techniques, etc., we started to get great wins with some liberty. Um, we, we, we had a bunch of you know fantastic projects where we just did things extremely quickly um, did things that were probably unheard of yesteryear and started getting lots of you know lots of good press and, and good stories around, around the industries and I think I remember that 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 first meeting we had and I kind of thought I remember saying to Mark um, we kind of had what we called our building blocks picture and I remember saying I, I think this is interesting, but there's something I'm missing because this doesn't really make sense. Why is this not happening elsewhere? And I remember um, I got some time with yourself. I remember explaining the, the building blocks and you're kind of like, yep, 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 makes sense. And I was waiting for the feedback for the thing I've missed. And you're kind of like, no, this is very good. And Mark and I were shocked. We were kind of like, really? Um, so it was kind of nice validation that we were heading in the right direction because we, we had been stuck for many years, kind of working and iterating in this way of working and experimenting. As you probably say about the, the position we were in within Liberty IT in Belfast, we were like an architecture team and Liberty IT was about 600 people at the time. And we were kind of writing software across all of Liberty Mutual. So we were kind of like specialist software engineering function of Liberty Mutual. So we had kind of different teams operating right across the whole enterprise. So we had a great view of what was happening. So we had we were working on very cutting edge projects and had the the, the, the ability to influence so that was a, a really fortunate position to be in. And then um, as we started kind of thinking, okay, we, 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 I think we should um, codify this model. And um, again, you're too kind because you said, no, you, should, you need to write a book. <laughs> I was intending on taking a break. I think I'll just maybe sit and relax for a little while. And you were like, no, you must write a book. So that was... So thank you for that. I think book. you did suggest then, that you might write, you were thinking of writing a book. And I said, no, no, you should definitely write a book. I yeah. think was, it wasn't just like, hey, I forced you to write a book. <laughs> you, were, you, you were kind of heading in that direction. But yeah, it, yeah that's, it takes that's a, fair. It's a, the other thing, of course, with writing books, it's at least 10 times more work than you could possibly imagine. But, yes. it, but it, is, it is definitely worth doing. It's something I recommend people try to do once in their life if they've got a book in them. But don't underestimate just how hard it is. So it's, it's a real achievement just to get a book out at all. Yeah, definitely. And again, the, the story with, 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 with Gene Kim was really funny because when I had a half-decent draft, I met Gene and some of the IT Revolution team. Gene was brilliant. He kind of says, "Listen, David, I, I, you know, I, I think this is really interesting, but this serverless thing, I, I just don't get it, and I, I don't think this is for us, and I've never really understood orderly mapping. So, you know, it, it's kind of neat, it's kind of, it's kind of quirky, but I, this isn't for us. And I was kind of like, okay, that's fair enough, you know, nothing gained, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And he says, but I'd love to try orderly mapping someday because I think it's really interesting because what we're doing with, with, um." at IT Revolution. And I says, well, we, we have a call here for like an hour. Let's let's just do one now. And he was like, are you sure? Do you need to prepare? I said, no, no. If you, you talk for 10 minutes, I'll write, and then I'll show you a map, and we can see where it goes. So he just emptied his brain of all the things he was thinking about around DevOps Enterprise Summit and, you know, IT Revolution, et cetera. And I was able to draw out three really nice value streams. Um, 
tell them which one was the, the most important one and draw a line of nothing under here matters. And he was just like, whoa, <laughs> did, you, did you just do that in 10 minutes? And I was like, yeah, but you, you know, that's your three value chains and this is where you need to focus. And I said, but as an engineer, you're probably focusing down here in this custom build area because you think it's interesting, but that's not what you need for IT revolution. And he was exactly. So just that clarity of thought of mapping what was in his head and a real simple map, it blew him away. And he turned around actually in the meeting and then said, you know, we just got to publish this. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so that was, um, that, that started a, a great relationship with IT revolution. But I mean, I think, yeah, that's um, a, that's such a great story. I mean, partly just that Gene was open to it and you were able to show that what can happen when you use orderly mapping to just explore a space. If it's done right, it's an incredibly powerful technique. And yeah, it has to you have to kind of see it working for people to 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 get it. It takes a little bit more work. Generally speaking, I find it's fairly easy for people to understand a wardly map if one's being built in front of them. It's yeah. really difficult to create a worldly map. It's like music. Everyone enjoys listening to music, but, but it's actually pretty hard to create. You have to practice to create. So it's not that music is too complicated to listen to, or well, some is, but you know, but it generally isn't. But it is pretty, there is a lot of training. So that's kind of the asymmetry you find with it. And um, it's a very powerful technique. And you eventually you learn to 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 do it by by sort of listening to it and you know, effectively listening to people do it and watching people. Yeah. The music's a nice analogy because there are there's patterns in music and structures that you can't see. That's the same with mapping. You start to see patterns and shapes. Um, and it was a long time trying to figure that out. And then I mean, like I'm I'm still a, a kind of practicing architect, and really I would describe myself as a a practicing architect who's written some stuff down. And then I bring in Mark and Mike now, but um, but Mark, we had been mapping for a long time. And kind of, um, you know, trying to explore. It took us an awful long time to figure, to make sense of mapping. And we used that to inform all of our thinking over that probably 10 year period. And for me, the, the, the aha moment was that 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 thought of, and for anyone who hasn't seen worldly mapping yet, you have a, you have a customer with a value chain. You start off with a, with a customer need. And then what, what's the dependencies? And at the top of the value chain, it's most visible the y-axis and at the bottom is kind of least visible and hidden to the customer and then what's important is the x-axis around and there's four states of the evolution of, of a of a component um genesis which is brand new you know never been done custom which we understand how to build it but not quite sure product there's customer need and then utility or commodity which is the cost of doing business and once we got that that mindset clear it was like a whole new lens to look at technology. We could instantly see we shouldn't be building this. This is going to evolve. This is really important, but it's in custom. We need to move it to product. And I mean, Mark and I spent many, many years making sense of stuff through that. So maybe I'll pass over to Mark now to maybe kind of give a bit of your background. Yeah, so I joined Liberty, Liberty IT in Belfast in 2000, straight out of college. So and through that sort of modernization journey of a large enterprise, there was lots of pioneering work that we did around you know, the advent from client server to big SOA systems, from that to more microservices, from that to more containerization and Docker, and then obviously the, the public cloud. And then you know, around the 2014, 2015, the, the, the serverless sort of wave then um, it kicked in. And like Dave mentioned, around 2013, like we were increasingly becoming leaders within the organization and we were trying to figure out how, how do you actually lead at scale? How do you do these things? And that's where... You know, we we came across you know, Simon's Simon's work and then Worley mapping and it really did you know, help elevate our capabilities, elevate our thinking, give us so much more situational awareness and and you know, give us a lot more insights into you know where we should go next, where where should be the next movement, what's the next thing we should be investing in, what what's the next impediment we should be working to to remove, and I think as as the architecture team sort of grew, as, as Dave, myself, and Mike, you know, started working more collaboratively together, we used maps for everything. And then we brought it with the teams. We we, we started to map with the teams around map your stack. And Adrian, we, we would reference your talk on mapping your stack very frequently. It was a great technique, demystified it, but made it real for engineers who hadn't been exposed to to mapping in the in the past. 
So we would we would have whiteboards all around the office with with Wordly maps on them, right, and all the different tech stacks, and it was it was great. And we started to get a real sort of movement going. And so it wasn't just something that hey your architects were doing; it was something that was then spreading across across the organization. But I think the so actually, so, so to drop in there, but so the thing about Wordly mapping is you can map anything, and it gets confusing because people see so many different kinds of maps. And one of the things I did was a really simple technology stack map. Um, and I posted this whole video of it. If you, if you can go find it on, you, on YouTube if you look for my, my name. And, and it's just trying to make it simple enough, but it was a technique that was useful because everybody's got a technology stack and you need to evolve that stack. And you're always evolving your stack. You're moving from say a custom thing that wrote files to disk to um, okay, we're going to use a, a commercial database. Uh, actually, um, now we want to use an open source one. Now we're, going, now we're going to buy a database as a service and not need to run it, right? So that's an evolution through kind of the four stages of, of, uh, of a technology stack. And the main thing was to keep it simple and make it a useful tool. So this is, it's a great place to start, but then we'll talk a bit later about it. there are many other different types of maps. And once you get your head around a few of them, you can see different ways to apply it. But yeah, yeah. So and, and, and it was a great vehicle for. We were really trying to push and pioneer serverless first and serverless capabilities. But to get teams to adopt that, drawing out the map on the board really give them that insight and that aha. Oh, oh, we've custom built our database and we have it on a server under my desk. That's not going to work very well in the future, right? So you can very visibly see what the evolution should be for that team and it helped support our ideas and our, our thinking around to how we should proceed as, a, as an organization. Yeah, maybe I mean, Michael can join in, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I was, just, I, I was just going to add in, you know, like, you know, when you think back, you know, I, I think Dave made a, a good point there. You know, a lot of us are, we're practicing architects and, uh, and a lot of really what we've tried to capture in the book are, you know, approaches and techniques that have effectively facilitated us being able to evolve and to pioneer and to move things along. You know, when I think back to when I kind of started working with Mark and it was way back in, start working with Mark like 2005 and we start working with Dave 2007 and we were building out like a large e-com in a platform and we were largely on-prem. So a lot of what we had to do as engineers was make the most of the capacity that we had on-prem and, you know, we were, you know, we were on the on the front end of kind of moving a lot of the, you know, for example, moving moving away from sort of uh, on-prem compute for serving up, say, our, our our applications, moving more towards single page apps. And we were always kind of pushing and looking for ways to, you know, cut down the amount of work that we had to do to kind of deliver an outcome. Um, and then when we introduced, you know, once we once we got better at it and we, you know, we were sort of looking for ways to bring people along on that journey, both up and down the, the elevator, we just found that the, the mapping was such a such an awesome tool for just focusing a conversation or you know being able to talk um in a in a in the same language you know us as architects we can get in and we can, can blame people with technology sometimes which can put product people off or put um, a business person off and it's very hard to then bring them along on a particular journey or communicate a certain message so what we kind of find is you know as we were honing our skills and we were constantly looking for efficiencies and operational gains and you know as well as kind of adding customer value and remaining on the, the vanguard and pushing things along it's just such a good way of communicating in a in a single language you know talking the same um you know, talking on the same points and i've had loads of good examples where you know we'd be maybe going in circles for you know like months and then you introduce a mapping session and then you go straight to the you know within 10 minutes 15 minutes you're straight at the what you need to get to and so it's uh that's well, how we kind of, you know, drop a mic. You, I mean, especially yeah. you, you had a number of cases where you'd maybe you're very senior business people, and you know what once happened when there's like senior people visiting the company, and you lay out this, you know, days of agenda and everything scripted, <laughs> and you were always very good at saying, "I just want to map for the morning and see what happens." There's always a lot yeah. of nervousness about that, but um, yeah. almost every single time whoever it was that was you know we were working through the map they quite saying ah we we know what to do now that was brilliant that was awesome you know completely unscripted but really what it is it's a facilitated conversation and you were brilliant at that that happened so many times yeah i've, I've seen that happen a few times i did that with a, a few customers where we were doing some kind of 
whole like long workshop, whole room full of people trying to figure something out. And eventually I say, hang on a minute, can I just get up at the whiteboard and draw some stuff out? And then go, what, what did, how, how did you do that? <laughs> so, so later on, how, can you do one of those again with us? How, what, how do we do that? So it's, um, it definitely yeah. is good to do in those environments. And I kind of wrote up a, a little story of that in one of the IT revolution papers. I think that was uh, last year's paper, the, sorry, the 2021 paper. There was a whole story there of um, an automotive company trying to figure out what to insource, what to outsource. Um, mm. so there's a whole lot of papers there. So I think let, let's sort of step on a bit and talk a bit about the book itself. Um, I think, first of all, it's like, what is this flywheel effect? Why is the book, why is that so prominent in the title? What, what is that about? So I'll talk a bit about that. And then there's, I think, four different types of map that you talk about in the book. So maybe we can kind of go through. So let's talk for a bit of the structure of the book itself to, to uh, explain to the listeners what, what this is about. Sure. So really, the, the, the underlying sort of mechanism and the thing that we have been seeing forever is different strategy, a technology strategy and a business strategy. So really, the thing that drove us crazy was we need to join those together. How can we join those two things together? Because it shouldn't be two different departments. So really, whole premise, how do we join the business technology strategy? And really the idea of having a flywheel effect, something that you're constantly speeding up. It's not just a linear thing. That was very much in our thinking forever. So then as we started to sit back and think about the journey over the past 10 years, we, we, so we codified some of the things that were so important. And there's four phases in the, the value flywheel. The first one is clarity purpose. And really the clarity purpose is, it's it's the most fundamental question you ask when you're starting something. Why are you doing this? What does success look like? And it's really, and that, that's a great question for the CEO or senior business person. Why are we here? We're, we're building next XY project, get it, why? And if there's that clarity purpose exists, it's very easy. So we've been using things like North Stars and like time to value and be really clear what that clarity of purpose is. The second phase is what I call challenge your landscape. Once you're very clear in your purpose, do you have the organization or the, the, the right kind of environment, the, the, the environment of success to actually move forward? It, it, can people challenge that clarity purpose? Can they ask questions about it? Can they say, well, that's fine, but we don't have this. So there's a socio-technical angle to that. So these first two are very much like business focus in the environment. And then the third phase is um, next best action. It's really when we get down to kind of the, the technology, the developer experience. If you have a serverless first kind of uh, environment or strategy set up, you can, you can create things very quickly. So you've clarity of purpose, we have an environment, boom, what about this? And you start that kind of fast feedback. You're not saying, give me six months to build something. You can create something very quickly and start a kind of, you know, a fast feedback loop. And then the fourth phase is long-term value. And it's really a nod to kind of problem prevention and sustainability. So how can we think of well-architected and a good sustainable kind of, you know, approach to how we, how we create this overall system? So really, once they start to kind of, that fly starts to turn, then you're back to what do we do next? And, that, and you kind of get that momentum. So that's how we split it up. Really, the, the clarity, purpose and challenges about the, the environment and the, the business type environment within the organization. And next best action and long-term value really about as an engineer and architect, how you, how you approach your work. So that was really how the, that's the kind of the, the framework we have in the book. And this is the, this is very consistent and there's really um, techniques and maps associated with all four phases. Yeah, that really just, you know, a lot of the, the building blocks that we talked to, talked about at the start, you know, there were things that we found that really worked. Right, really, they were proven to work. It wasn't just you know, me and Mike's ideas. It was things that we actually had either delivered ourselves or seen working in in, in our organization, and really delivering value. Either really practical, you know, um, capabilities and techniques and processes that really had an impact. So we were able to you know, uh, prove this out, and because we were working across all different areas of of a large enterprise, we were getting fast feedback on some of these techniques and some of these processes. So we, we, we knew they were proven to work, they were proven valuable. I think codifying in the book has really just helped us clarify all the things that we sort of we talk about and then just oh we move on. But now it's actually now, now it's, now it's, it's great to see. Let's talk a bit about we've talked a bit about the technology stack. What about 
um, sort of mapping the market that you're operating in and the, the there's a whole if you look if you watch Simon's talks a lot of what he's talking about is moves in a market like you you map out your the whole space you're operating in you've got your competition and a map is in some sense a it's a sort of going back to the sort of Sun Tzu strategy or out of war kind of thing it's like you're operating in a market you have your competition there's the the climate the landscape that you're operating in so you're trying to figure out what's the right move to make that's going to give you advantage in the market and then how do you align your business purpose to that right so there's something mm. in that area maybe because of do you have sort of an example of one of those maybe taken from the book or something where we could just sort of make that a little bit more concrete for people I think we're gonna, I'm not sure if I have an example off the top of my head, but um, really well, the map si market. Simon has some good examples around open source, right? So you're in a space and there's a technology which somebody's making a lot of money out of. Mm. And you look at that and say, what you really want to do is sell something else. But what you can do is disrupt the market by effectively open sourcing and commoditizing out some key value that is in that market, right? So that's open source as a competitive weapon. There's those sorts of moves. And there's less of that. I mean, that doesn't really apply to, that's more in the sort of IT, uh, enterprise IT kind of space where you're trying to sell software to people. But uh, I was thinking maybe there's an example of sort of maybe a sort of insurance product or something like that. So what, something you did at Liberty Mutual, there's some, some, some test cases and some example cases. Well, there, was right? a nice, there was a nice use case around Cloud Guru that we have a, a, as a, a use case in the book. And there's a famous story that, that we wrote up and, and drew from and helped us with that. Um, and they had a famous story. They had one of their service conferences back in, I think it was 2016. And they were starting to really get excited about, about the community and serverless conferences. And this was all great. And uh, they invited Simon to speak at their, um, I think it was Service Conf was the name of the event. And, um, so when in San Francisco, I think. I think it? it was in San Francisco. Yeah, and I, I think the well. founders were there. And um, some, I think it was Drew said, you, you need to talk to this guy, about what we're doing. So Simon just asked a bunch of really basic questions and talked about the community and he, they talked about everything. Simon just scribbled out a map on a napkin. And he pretty much says, Do your most important value stream is, is, your engineer who wants to learn and making them feel empowered to learn about the cloud. That's it. And he drew this big line. He says nothing else matters. And he drew this on a on a napkin. And he he gets he drew his um his worldly strategy cycle as well. And then he signed it, put a date on it, and drew has a photograph of that. So we, we put that in the book. And I mean, and, and they, they said afterwards that that was their kind of catalyst to say, why are we doing all this extra stuff? We need to just focus on teaching engineers the cloud. That's it. And they have a, I can't remember the exact line, but it's like every engineer can become a cloud guru, something like that. And that that was their North Star. So that clarity purpose went from driving this huge cloud community to just really enabling developers to learn. So I, I said that was they, they effectively mapped out the entire market and focused on one thing, which I thought was very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think we were, <clears throat> when we talk about like mapping the market, <laughs> You know, there's there's lots of there's lots of smaller examples. I'm, I'm trying to work out if I could describe in sort of an abstract fashion. But the idea would be like we'd we'd be looking at you know like you're in a working for like a large corporation or large insurance company, and we you know the emergence of AI for you know and, and all of a sudden you've lots of teams who want to do artificial intelligence or leverage applied artificial intelligence. Um, you know, and that involves you know you think about what it would take to actually set up a team that you know. How do we get the data? You know, how do we then get into data science and and do all that stuff? And you find like organizations will will attempt that. Um, but certainly in a practical sense, you know, in a day to day, what we kind of find is there's lots of examples where if you're mapping that market, you you know, you're visualizing well, what are we actually what what's our actual mission? What's our actual purpose? You know, are we do we want to be a company that trains these models and provides those those services? Or say, for example, we were looking at, um, you know. Can we determine a vehicle and prevent fraud through users uploading their their pictures? Is that really the the path we want to go down? Do we want to become world class experts at that? But then, what's our landscape? You know, what are our options? You know, are there certain affinities or synergies there um, that we could leverage? As opposed, you know, is there commodities or products off a shelf, or do we then have to 
go through that whole innovate leverage commoditize um you know strategy and gameplay and or you know what what is the you know what are we what's the, the next best move you know and so when you kind of map that out and you apply well what's on the market that we could use or do we uh, do we do we need to kind of you know, do we need to build something and then open source it? You know, there's lots of good examples like Kafka, for example, or LinkedIn. You know, they didn't want to become an organization that was specialists in sort of large, you know, becoming, you know, high throughput data um, sort of streaming. What they did is they they they, they give Kafka made it made it open source and you know got all the, the the contributions from the from the community. So there's there's lots of, you know, from a strategic perspective, when you're working at, at that level, it just helps with good decision making, you know, typically on a day to day. Um, I love that side of mapping, you know, once you kind of get into the, the strategy cycle and you go through the, you know, the why you start off with the observation, you observe the landscape, and then you you kind of walk through the, you know, the, the climatic patterns or the things that are going to change or are going to impact things in the next sort of period and then you get through the, the, the doctrine and sort of really says how do you not kill yourself with your your change and then you get into the why of movement and that's all about making good decisions and taking up good positions and and then you kind of get into the dark arts of gameplay which i really enjoy <laughs> um, which is probably a book in itself and an award uh, simon's written a, a book on that which is fantastic or you know, it's, it's creative commons as well, which is it's good food for thought. And I apologize, guys, I know I'm going on a, a, a bit on this, but certainly the why of, you know, the the, the, the market analysis is certainly an, an interesting one. And and also I kind of feel like sometimes the the absence of things on map, maps is actually quite an interesting topic. You know, so you as an organization, we're always focused on things that are in the, the custom built or in the, the product. I always kind of find as well, is there, is there, if there's an absence of things in the genesis, is you know what do we not know you know what is that actually telling us what questions are we not asking um and again it's there's there's lots of good things and you know uh, pick that up um, you can kind of map where you think the competition is doing something yes and then and then get your <laughs> management signals. scared scared enough to actually do something <laughs> so well, this is, yeah and mark always talks about the you know the the weak signals and you know and simon and how, and how you get into that stuff and that's very good there's also a piece sometimes of um, often what, what, in, in, a, in a big company like Liberty Mutual, someone somewhere knows the market way better than the engineers. And um, the answer is somewhere way back up the, the stack. Um, but actually using a map to make sense of that higher order strategy that makes you really focus on what the important thing is and then even validate that. And maybe you're talking to, I don't know, a business leader who's been talking to a vice president and, and you, you know you're maybe one or two clicks away so really they say this is what we see is this the important thing and they went yeah i, I wouldn't have described it like that but yeah that's exactly what it is so really just trying to make sense of the direction because especially with insurance sometimes there's it's a many year process they they make a move in an area so it's it's you need that kind of clarification sometimes so that's I used to draw this as an OODA loop, right? It's another thing mm. that Simon uses, the observe, observe, orient, decide, act loop. Um, and the the competitive aspect of that is if you're sort of dogfighting with somebody, if you can get around your loop faster than the people you're competing with, then you, they just end up being confused, whereas you know what you're doing. So we've talked quite a bit so far about how to make decisions, you know, see the market so you can see what you should be doing. That's the sort of observe part. Um, and then you're trying to orient yourself uh, and, and with speeding up the decision-making piece. But then I think the, the other piece um, that the book talks about, and, and I mentioned at the beginning, is just the speed at which you, in particular, your team was getting stuff done is unprecedented. I, I, it's way faster than what I've seen just about anywhere else. And so can we talk a bit about how, okay, you, you decided to do serverless first and then maybe how that spread through the organization. I know at some point um, you took it up to board level. I mean, there was a lot of awareness in the organization that there was something different happening here that you were able to get stuff done much quicker. So let's, let's just talk about the speed of the um, sort of the, the act part, if you like, of the OODA loop for a bit. Yeah, I think I mean, one of the things that we talked about when we had that initial conversation with, with, with AWS, probably in 2013, 
um that was kind of at an organization level i was kind of in the room and a lot of the my my peers the lead architects were worried about security networking policy on ramp all the usual things that enterprise would worry about and my specialism was software so i was thinking to myself okay i i, I see what's happening here i'm certainly not a network expert but how do we how will we write software when we get there so it felt like we probably had a year or two while a lot of the infrastructure was being sorted out to figure out how we would write software. So I gave myself two or three years to try and figure it out. Now, luckily, Lambda came out in 2014, so that would that give us a, something to, to look at. But, you know, we had groups who wanted to stay in Java EE. We had the Cloud Foundry Pass kind of contingent. We had the Docker containerization contingent. And then we were kind of thinking about, and all of those were good approaches. We took something from the wall. Um, some with flaws, but you know there, there was there was lots of interest in learning. So really, the idea of and um, this idea of what, what kind of constantly stuck in our heads was removing undifferentiated heavy lifting. That was a phrase we'd been using for probably fifteen years, and and one of our other architects, Ed Carmody, constantly <laughs> repeated that phrase. Um, so that was always in our head. We, we, how can we get it? How can we remove operational burden, not do things that we don't need to do? So there was always a lot of work with the infrastructure team and not wrapping around the cloud, but creating that kind of platform. And, and, and so that was a very fundamental idea of, of probably the early things of developer experience. We I spent a lot of time with the security team and the CISO kind of explained that the cloud is okay and, and serverless actually is more secure probably than anything else. That, that was a big piece, getting the right kind of um, security enablement in place and then spending lots of time with the teams and thinking about a different way of working. So there's probably a few things. One of the things we talked about a lot was engineering excellence, teaching engineering rigor and discipline in the right environment. So we probably had a few different threads going on where we um, started to put those building blocks in place um, and then what, what gave us some of the momentum is some of the quick wins. One of the first service projects, I think, was a document generation application, which was tiny, but it just showed the scalability of Lambda. So we had lots of small wins and we were kind of piecing them together. So it didn't feel quick at the time because we probably had maybe, I'd say, three years of putting things in place. But once we had those things in place, probably around 2017-ish, that's when we really started to move. We kind of we slowly built momentum, and um and I mean, Mark done a lot of great work in workshops and helping teams like as an, an enabling architect helping teams kind of get moving, and really we had a lot of things I would I'll say it's like almost described as expertise without the ego. We were very keen to help other teams and get teams moving quickly. There was no kind of real competition. So I think once we get to that twenty seventeen stage, we started to see teams get excited by what was there have the right environment and be able to create these fantastic projects without us having to drop into the team, say, you need to do this. Teams would innovate by themselves by creating, you know, a financial system, a claim system, whatever, and they would have some innovative use of a serverless technology. And we were just constantly being surprised by the teams. So we almost had the, the groundswell of engineering teams who were keen to do, to innovate. And then kind of our, in our pincer movement, I was talking at the more senior level, saying, you know, clearing the path and creating some air cover. The fact, and, and if not that there was, but if there's ever any going to be a, a mandate, like everyone must use Kubernetes, I would have been, hang on a second, let's not go down that path. So I just made sure that the path was clear at a senior level. I mean, Mark, you spent a lot of time doing workshops and, and helping teams kind of really get their head around, not just Lambda, but that serverless mindset. Yeah, and I think it's like we we were always heavily invested in engineering excellence and trying to improve the practices, right? And trying to give teams more autonomy and more ownership. But the only way to do that was to, to make sure that the guardrails were in place. Like we're, as a large enterprise, you wanted to make sure that all of those big enterprise concerns were were taken care of, security, you know, networking, you know, performance, scalability, reliability. So you know, we we worked very hard to put those patterns patterns, excuse me, put those patterns in place put those, those capabilities in place so that we could give the teams more autonomy, more freedom to do this stuff, right? And one way of doing that was you know, walking the talk, right? We, we, we got hands-on. We did the workshops. We, we delivered the workshops. And you know, we, we had a lot of great success taking some of you know, AWS's you know, standard workshops that they were delivering and then tailoring to them to our context and then delivering them ourselves. 
so that we were then getting the feedback loop ourselves. It wasn't you know, um, AWS coming in, it wasn't the vendor coming in. It was our own people delivering these workshops to our own people. And then we were then able to get that feedback loop. We were able to get you know, get more insights into what the impediments were, what the blockers were. Um, so that was giving us that, that, that time to value. That was giving us that feedback loop. That was give, enabling the teams to get valuable stuff into the hands of our, our customers and our, our policyholders. And at the same time, like Dave mentioned, we had this pincer movement going on. So we were doing the, the elevator architect, right? We were going up to the C-suite and doing the presentation and the, the, the PowerPoint slides on so serverless first mindset and approach. You know, uh, CDK uh, was coming coming to the forefront there as well. And really just making sure that we, we created that environment for success, right? From both on the ground with the teams so that they could move fast and they could see valuable results. And, you know, they weren't being blocked by anybody, but also then creating the... The, the error cover, I guess, at, at, at the top level to, to enable teams to experiment rapidly, to enable teams to take maybe what we're seeing as risk, but because we had all these good guardrails in place, we knew that they couldn't go too far off off the, the path to production. Yeah. And I think I think that's like some of the, the what do you call the, the enabling teams are absolutely critical, like the infrastructure team, the security teams, even the audit teams. I mean, we would often... Like I wouldn't say infiltrate because we, we knew a lot of the leads and you know great very talented people. But people would say, well, the auditor, the audit team may not let you do serverless. And so, well, we're going to go meet the audit team and train them how to. This is how you audit serverless. And then they would audit cloud projects with the serverless mindset. You know, the security won't let you do that. Well, let's go and look at the process. Let's understand the control and let's re-implement the control in a better way. So we kept going behind the process and and. and Every single time, the stakeholder would be like, well, I don't really care about the process, but it's the best thing I can think of. And then you'd rethink that with this new technology and they would think, wow, that's much better. So we, we kept doing that, which, which again, created a better environment for the engineers. Yeah, and Drew Worley yeah. mapped that. We mapped out what are the things we need to put in place to make this, make this successful. And one of the big things was, you know, we need an architecture standard. We need some sort of guidance for teams about what a, what a well-architected solution would be. So we, you know, we didn't custom build our own. We didn't decide here. Here's Mark no. Mixon Dave's architecture standards for for the cloud. We leveraged the AWS Well Architected Framework. It's been proven and hardened and you know, been iterated on constantly. So we were big big advocates of that. That wasn't wasn't what we were saying. Here's what the industry is doing. Here's what good practices. Here's what Adrian's talking about on stage at, at reInvent and other conferences. You know, don't don't just listen to us. Listen to the experts. And that was one of the key sort of approaches we had for for getting that adoption. Was it was almost like external validation was helping to drive our internal adoption. You know, we've, it's not just you know don't listen to us. Listen to Adrian. He'll he'll tell you. He'll he'll stay here. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah, and more like Werner in particular at some of the keynotes. And um, let's talk about, you mentioned CDK. Let's talk about CDK a bit, because what you did was you started taking these patterns and just encoding them, making it sort of very simple to get started. Um, mm. And then you open source them. So the CDK patterns, is it .com? I kind of remember it's .com. Yeah, I think it's it CDKpatterns.com. Yeah. Yeah. And... Lots of good work there. Another one of your colleagues um, should just tell that story and then ended up with um, getting an award from Werner at reInvent a year, year or so ago. It was just such a cool story. So maybe just yeah. talk about what happened there and just, just how, quick, how quickly can you get something done is really the thing that is the real driver here. Yeah, well, I, I can probably tee it up and let Mark tell the story because because a lot of it was, was, Mark was instrumental in driving that. But w one of the, as we were doing infrastructure as code and even the internal cloud, a lot of the YAML and cloud formation was a huge barrier. And a lot of the big pushback we were getting around maybe 2014, 2015 was only the very, very top engineers can do infrastructure as code because cloud formation is so complicated and the tools are around back then. So we always had this problem, but like almost like this adoption hurdle because infrastructure as code is so complex. And one of the things that, that we did with AWS is we disabled access to the AWS console in all environments except sandbox. So you could go in your sandbox, play with something, but once you get into even a dev environment, infrastructure is code. So absolutely, that's the only way, the only path to production. So a lot of people seen that as a barrier because you had to write these huge, you know, YAML files, which which were difficult and, and buggy and you couldn't share them. And so we were always big on inner source and reuse. We've been doing that, trying to do that for years. So we were trying to figure out how do we 
how do we create reuse with this? And it just wasn't working because we we're trying to write components of infrastructure files. So this went on for years with a bunch of different ideas. And then you know, Mark is laser sharp on what's coming out. So you know, Mark, you can you can you can talk about when you've seen CDK announced and you jumped on yeah. it probably instantly in the same day. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah. And that was one of the things that we we had good situational awareness about you know how the landscape was evolving in, in the cloud space. And we were all keen students of everything that was happening and just absorbing everything we, we could get our hands on. So CDK came out and we we're like, ah, that's interesting because it was in a it it lowered the cognitive burden for teams to play with the cloud or, or experiment in the cloud or deliver in the cloud. So you know, whenever that came out, it was like, oh, that's 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 something we can use, right? We're always about shifting should, stuff left. Should explain what CDK is for people that may not have. Oh aware yeah. Of it. So so the cloud the cloud development kit is a is a higher order um, abstraction on top of the cloud communication the infrastructure sort of, um, capability for for deploying resources into into the cloud, right? But again, it's a it's an abstraction on that. It's higher level sort of language building blocks so on top of it. You're writing code in you know JavaScript or TypeScript or Python yep. rather than YAML, and that makes it more composable. And you've got all the structure. I think one of the problems with YAML is it's fine for small things. People ended up building languages in YAML, and YAML isn't a good place to be trying to do abstraction and variables. And like you create some entity at some point, and you need to be able to pass that. It, the result of that entity, some in, some identifier needs to be used later on in the in the deployment. So it's there's kludges for doing this in YAML, but it makes much more sense to code this in a, in a real language. And I think that's the and there's there's this kind of formation with with CDK. There's also I mean Terraform has some things like this, and and Pulumi have also done a similar kind of thing to CDK. Mm. So there's there's other approaches around, but. CDK was particularly useful because it really dialed into all of the AWS capabilities and gave you just a much much easier way of thinking about it. Yeah, and the timing was perfect for us because we were trying to really scale these ways of working and these practices across thousands of developers globally. So we needed to lower that barrier for them to adopt what we were pushing with the service first sort of mindset and approach. So CDK came, came in, it was like manna from heaven for us because it helped significantly lower that uh, adoption barriers for, for new teams who maybe had only ever delivered software on premises or had only done to, um, to traditional sort of development processes. So now we were talking in a language that was familiar with them. We were able to go through a workshop and have them up and running within you know, two or three hours, deploying stuff into a, a sandbox environment. And that just demystified the cloud for them. That just demystified serverless for them. Um, there was a workshop, um, CDK and workshop.com, I think it is that AWS delivered. And it was perfectly pitched and like we mentioned this earlier but we then were able to take that and tailor that to our ecosystem and our context and make it work with our CICD pipelines and make it work with our enterprise guardrails and again that just really removed any of the barriers to entry for those teams who were maybe on the fence about adopting the serverless first mindset and approach and that just got them over the line and then from that we would deliver that workshop and then one or two days later they would say oh we just did this thing uh, it's in production now and it was like two days later, they were they were in production after we've done like a, a half day workshop with them. That was just yeah, that was the fly we really starting to turn. Yeah, it's a, it was these kind of stories like what in a few days. This is something that if you did a normal schedule, it would be yeah. weeks or months, right? right. And so and that was the thing that was so mind blowing. And that's kind of that's like everyone wants speed at scale, right? That I I talked to CTOs and people, you know, how do we go faster? And it's like, well, would you like to get stuff done in a few days? And they said, but no, no, it takes it takes us a, a couple of weeks to create a new Kubernetes cluster because we have to yeah. go talk to everybody. And it's like, but you could have finished building the whole thing in less time than that, right? In the time it takes to talk to everybody about how you you want to build it, you could have finished, right? So there's something, maybe it's just digging a bit deeper on like, what is the actual, like if you want to, somebody comes up with some new product idea, like what do you actually have to do to get that into production in a few days. Like how long does it actually take? Where are the synchronization points? What what are you doing for those few days that's different to the few weeks you'd normally spend? Yeah, and I think that's, and again, I was, I was going to chip on this one earlier, but you know, in order to facilitate um, teams moving at that speed, a lot of what we talk about in the book is aimed at 
you know, having teams that are very capable of understanding their purpose and understanding, you know, why am I building this particular feature and really get laser, you know, get laser focused. Dave says about marrying the business functionality with the technology one. Um, you know, so in order to move fast, you got to know what is you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to accomplish. And, and sort of what we find is, you know, when we, once we kind of get into this sort of way of working, you know, a team could come up with a hypothesis or, you know, they could come up with a feature that they want to release. And the idea is we just want to get something out fast. You have no guarantee that anything's going to be a success or customers going to use it or they're going to, get, you know, something's going to get um, adopted. So we, we, we find that, you know, when teams are, when we facilitate teams in this sort of way, we can give them a well-architected pattern, you know, so we get patterns that we codify that have been hardened by already being out in production. So then we would take it, we had to codify it, we'd apply certain settings or configurations that would sort of speed that up and they would ship it out, you know, and so we'd try and get something out reasonably quickly, get it in front of customers or users, get 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 initial feedback. And then as you, you know, in a lot of, you know, the education needs and you pull together is, you know, we talk about rapid delivery, rapid development, you know, and, and serverless can be very, it's very complementary with, you know, event-driven architectures, but also it's very complementary with sort of that product led mindset and just getting things out. So we did need to then, if something was successful and we wanted to kind of scale it up, then we would have decisions around, well, you know, how do we keep iterating? How do we keep mm -hmm. incrementing? How do we keep just sort of moving, you know, fast? Do we keep investing it? And, you know, we were talking, um, David and Mark and I were kind of talking about this last week and a big, big thing was we started switching things off in production, which wasn't, you know, something we used to experience, you know, typically mm -hmm. large enterprises, they invest all this, you know, if you're working in the traditional sense, that's the sunken cost fallacy. So you'd build these large apps, deploy them up, and it never gets switched off because obviously, <laughs> you know, we put all this time and in, in investment into it. But then you'd find you're working in this way, you're, think you're, you accept mm -hmm. things that work. Okay, pivot, adapt. But, but I think even that mindset, we, we talked earlier about the infrastructure team. I mean, we started this journey around 13, 14. By around 2019, when um, CDK came out, we had also been experimenting with what does the developer platform look like? And we had a couple of efforts to put that together. And by 2019, we started this idea of a single path to production, what we called our sort of our, uh, our software accelerator, where everything, we had a single area where our patterns lived. So I think we'll go back to the, the kind of the, the CDK stuff. As we had that, we were starting to align on a, on a, on a single kind of path to production. And um, Matt Coulter then joined the team midway through 2019, I believe it was. And um, I mean, Matt, Matt was brilliant. We had, it, it blew him away. The fact that CDK would take like a, whatever, like a, you know, like an 11,000 line um, YAML file and the 14 lines of CDK to create like an API gateway. So Matt, so like Matt and Mark spent a lot of time working together and figuring out how do we bring them to the workshop, et cetera. And then I think, um, I believe it was January-ish um, 2020, Matt launched CDK Patterns and did an unbelievable piece of work around just making it super easy to just effectively instantiate any of those kind of patterns and taking all those patterns from, um, you know, so a lot of the enterprise integration patterns, some of um, Jeremy Daly's pattern, et cetera. Just anything that you could think of, Matt would just quote it really quickly. And it was, it, it, it took a while. Like Matt, Matt done a fantastic job over that first six to nine months and kind of growing that 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 concept. But once that kind of caught fire, it was just, you know, and, and, and Matt explains it really well. Like, and I mean, Mark yourself, Matt did a lot of work yeah. kind of honing that approach. Yeah, and I think you know, the the award from, from Bernard for Matt was so well deserved because it was just yeah. absolute game changer and internally we then had our own version of it that just had a few more enterprise guardrails but you know talking about the speed you know we had this software accelerator portal and we've talked about it i think you, you can find the video on, on youtube as well um where a developer could click a button and get a cicd pipeline with you know, a hardened pattern that could take them through production that day or within minutes effectively, right? And then they could iterate, right? So you're once you're in production, you've got a, a golden path to production. Now you're now you now you can iterate. Now you can start thinking about what's the next business feature, what's the next valuable thing that I can deliver into the hands of my users, right? So again, yeah. removing a lot of that friction. And we talk about that fast flow and with like all the stuff we've been doing is around enabling and empowering our developers and removing those impediments to fast flow. Because right? yeah. your speed is actual safety. The faster you can go, the quicker you can get that feedback. 
the 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 sooner then you can you can you know, course correct or or add in the yeah. new new yeah. capabilities right and I think I mean it's, a, a, it's, a, another idea of speed. Yeah. Sorry, just quick. And that idea of speed was really important because I think it was in like 2014. I was in some like 2020 future project, and I came up with this line: "Could we be released ready in one hour? Could we get from idea to production within an hour?" And people laughed at that; it was ridiculous. But then, with there was a whole team effort over many years, and the, and one of our goals after we started not with AWS was: can we get an engineer in the keynote? <laughs> And you know you, that that doesn't just happen. You need to be asked. And um, and at the start we were kind of delighted we get a mention. Uh, you know we did be a logo on the screen and we were kind of like going yay. And then uh, I think it was um, in twenty one, Matt uh, did the keynote and he did such a good job. He told that, the whole that story. That keynote was was amazing. I mean he was so high energy Brilliant. on stage. It it was it Brilliant. was a great presentation. And, and yeah. just a great, great outcome. It's a, we I, should was, try and find, I know if there's actually a clip of that on that particular piece on YouTube, so if we yeah. can find it. I think but it's worth watching. AWS yeah. events. And I was, I was up in the front row taking loads of photographs. So I was absolutely <laughs> delighted. It was brilliant. Yeah. So that's kind of part of the feedback loop here of working with the suppliers, right? So AWS is a supplier. This is one of the things we learned at Netflix was we could, by, by making AWS successful and promoting AWS, we got um, we got the ability to sort of steer some of the things AWS did and build some community around it and build more people sort of using these tools the way that we were using them. So if, you, if you're gonna dive onto a tool like CDK when it first comes out, you don't want it to be die on the vine and you end up being the only people that figured out how to use it. So, yeah. so it's important if you're an early adopter to actually take the extra effort to make it successful. And then it ends up as part of the mainstream instead of ending up on a, on a side path. And that's one of those sort of higher level um, things that to, to think about. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're starting to run out of time now. So let's just sort of wrap up a little bit with like, what are you folks doing now? Um, I know you have your own little uh, podcast thing that you do sort of that you still do together. So just talk a little bit about that and how people can find you and um, sort of what's, where are you going next and what's happening at you know, Liberty Mutual, I guess they're continuing to do things and with, with the team that, that's still there, but uh, just give yeah, us all absolutely. summary. I mean, um, so we have uh, on the serverlessedge.com is the blog where we kind of, we, we still write and, 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 and put content out. And we have a, a very, we, we purposely did a very short blog called serverless crack we try and keep it down to 10 15 minutes where we try and just try and keep it fairly accessible and talk about the concepts so that's serverless crack i think that's on youtube that's the podcast right it's yeah. the podcast yeah i mean we, we keep it fairly you know fairly informal again like what is a what is a crack it's some irish word or something I don't crack know. is irish word for just having a laugh so we're, we're trying we don't take ourselves too seriously we'll try and have a bit of fun you know and, and just um yeah, try and kind of lower the bar to entry a little bit. Again, be a bit more collaborative and inclusive. So it's good for you. C-R-A-I-C. C-R-A-I-C. Apparently it's not actually an Irish word, but that's a whole other argument for a different day. Um, okay. You often you, you go out in Ireland, you go out for the crack. You know, that's you go out for yeah. the for the Okay, fun. we've got the link. There's a link in the... Um... In the chat to yeah. the serverless crack there. Perfect. So I mean, we're still creating content, and for me, there's something about how can we keep leaning into these techniques and help people explore. So we're looking at can we create other content to, to help people because some of these techniques are quite difficult to learn. So we're trying to put as much content out as possible to help people along on the journey. Um, from Liberty Mutual perspective, funny, I, I I met a few of the guys yesterday in a in a sandwich shop, and they were they were having an architecture offsite in in Belfast, and they were just talking about what's happening next. And was, again, we still have many many friends in Liberty Mutual, and they're still doing fantastic work. I met a whole bunch of the team at uh, Reinvent a few months ago, so it's just it blows me away. They're 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 still they're still iterating, transforming. I mean, I would say it it, it wasn't us that that did that within Liberty Mutual. That the company has been evolving from a technology point for for decades. We just we just played a bit of a chapter. Again, probably for us, we're all um, partitioning architects. I'm doing a bit of work now with. Um, we're all kind of doing a bit of work for globalization partners. Don't know, Mark, if you want to 
What's your yeah. globalization partners? Yeah, so myself and Michael and now David's going to join us are, are architects of globalization partners and really have the uh, help help uh, enable you know, companies expand globally and, and putting in a lot of the, the capabilities to do that. So it's a, it's a really interesting mission, but it's, again, a lot of the, the, the things that we talk about in the book, applying that to a different context and a different sort of um, landscape is is exciting and interesting and challenging all at the same time. So a lot of these uh, techniques and processes and practices we're, 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 we're doing again for, for a new new organization, a new company, and it's, it's exciting to see that yeah, they 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 still work and they still resonate, and the same the, those uh, things that we've we've codified in the book are are actually you know they they make a real difference and they they really have yeah. a good impact. I think the event driven a lot of the event driven stuff is where it starts to get interesting. Sorry, Michael. No, I was going to add, you know, like um, in terms of what we're doing, you know, the book and there's a there's a sort of I just noticed a question in the chat around, you know, connecting, you know, what we're talking about to the the notion of a flywheel and. And really what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to work with squads, we want to work with the business, we want to work with sort of development teams to, so the organization is nimble, you know, so we're always kind of working on the right thing and we're always kind of following strategy and making good, good decisions. And, you know, there's, there's nothing there that's creating inertia for us. So in terms of where we're, we're moving into, you know, we're working on similar kind of setup within GP, you know, we're, we're going to be building lots of, you know, exciting new products and, you know, hopefully kind of, you know, driving, helping or facilitate, driving that organization through through technology, you know, reacting to the opportunity, being nimble and not having to, you know, do, do anything that keeps us slow um, or not being able to, you know. Yeah, and on one line, we, we're, we're building high-performing teams, teams, delivering well-architected service for solutions. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. cool. There you go. Uh, and um, any conferences you're going to be at in the next few months? Anywhere? Any appearances? Uh, um, actually, we're funny enough. Yeah, we've got a um, we're putting on a um, serverless days Belfast. Uh, we ran that back in 2020, which was a, a great catalyst for us in, in January 2020. We a lot of fantastic speakers, so we've decided to put that on again on the 28th of February in Belfast, and it's actually um, it's in the Game of Thrones studio. So the, oh. the actual studio where a lot of Game of Thrones was shot is just I'd say Belfast. So we're going to use that that entire venue. So we're going to have a, a bunch of talks around, and it's really about the fantasy and reality of serverless, creating serverless teams and making serverless real. That's you know we we understand the technology. How do you actually make this happen in an organization? Because I believe there's a great community here in Ireland and all of Ireland, but a lot of people understand you know event bridge land or whatever. But it's hard to make this happen. So we're going to focus the, the, the event on that. And there's a tour of the Game of Thrones stuff in the middle of that. So um, hopefully no one picks up a sword and attacks someone over uh, <laughs> transformational disagreements. Well, but uh, we're really you looking gotta forward to that. you got to watch out for critters coming in. Yeah. So we, we need to wrap up now. Um, I'm going to be keynoting the um, Chaos. Uh, there's a Chaos event, I think. What's it? Chaos Carnival? Um, in, mm. which is an online event. And then I'll be in person at QCon London at the end of March. So that's mid-March and end of March, if anyone wants to find me. But I think we need to wrap up now. We've hit the top of the hour. And thanks. And that was just great to catch up with you folk again and hope everyone had a good time. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much, Adrian and David, Michael and Mark. Appreciate it so much. There's a lot of links over there in the chat. So I'll leave this video open for just a few minutes if you want to go grab those. Come join us next week for a book club with the authors to learn more about serverless as well as the value flywheel effect. And we'll be having a uh, online workshop with the authors next week around how to wordly map as well. All that information is also on the website at itrevolution.com. So a lot more to get involved in here if you're interested. And we really hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks folks. Bye.